Hi, I'm Ruby Britt Height, Director of Community Relations at the Mint Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina. And welcome to the Mint's new series, Interventions, which includes art from our Ancient Americas collection and an installation by artist Julio Gonzalez capturing the Maya tradition. This program features two phenomenal artists, Julio Gonzalez and storyteller Alejandro Galvez Cruz. From mining past art finds in our collection to contemporary interpretations and storytelling in nature, you'll feel the rich connection to one of America's indigenous people, their language, and their culture. We hope this program will lead you to our galleries at Mint Museum Randolph to see and experience this truly enlightening installation as we embrace our similarities and respect our differences. Art is a catalyst for change. Hola, mi nombre es Kerma Moraine, coordinadora de programas comunitarios en el Mint Museum. Julio González es un artista multimedia autodidacta nacido en Atlanta, Georgia. Desde que dejó Atlanta cuando era un joven adolescente, Julio ha viajado mucho y ha expuesto su obra en museos, galerías y murales de todo el sureste. Una de las características que define a González como artista es su uso de elementos de diseños mayas y mexicanos para explorar cuestiones de la vida y los valores contemporáneos. Disfrute nuestro programa con el artista Julio González y la tradición maya y el narrador de historias Alejandro Galvez Cruz en el Mint Museum. Hi, Julio. Hey. Welcome back to the Mint Museum. <laughs> we are so excited to have you here to talk about your installation here in our Arts of Ancient America Gallery and wanted to talk about your um, cultural influences, your parents, and then exactly where they were from, and um, go from there. Okay, yeah, this is actually a great map um, kind of to break down um, all of the, the Americas, if you will. So um, mom is from Honduras, so right around here. So you got like connections to Guatemala, Belize, and dad is more on this side, which is more of that, um, Aztec area, northern Mexico. And so um, mom ended up migrating through Louisiana, dad through Atlanta, and then eventually ending up in Charlotte. And as far as um, looking back, um, when I was exploring kind of this topic of like where I come from, who am I, and all of that, it was a little difficult tracing it all back just because of things that happened with the family. So like on my mom's side, where they were at, there was a, um, like a sickness that went through the area that killed off a lot of the people. So for on that side, really all that's left are my grandmother and her sister, and then very, very distant family. Um, and then uh, on my dad's side, grandmother passed away a few years ago and got some stories there. Um, and grandfather, he died very early on, was actually um, investigating cattle theft and was assassinated. I see. And, uh, and so, yeah, as far as uh, the heritage and, and um, exploring that, a lot of that comes from, and what we're going to see comes from asking those questions and, and digging in and seeing what's there to be found. Okay, wonderful. Well, it sounds like you're ancestral influence has been great for this exhibition. So let's sit down and have a chat and yeah. talk a little bit more about it. Awesome. Julio, before we go and look at the hieroglyph and the Maya language, let's look at the scribe series that you put together. Okay. Yeah, this is a small selection. The total series is uh, 44 images. And I w I'm glad that we started here because this is kind of this 2D uh, line art is really where um, all of, all of this kind of originates from. So it's, it's all of the research and just the learning and then um, just putting pen to paper and, and, and drawing out uh, all of these things. Because one thing that um, I would say with this series is that the knowledge is there, but this is not, while the, yeah, the architectural and the anthropological knowledge is there, this, they're not uh, accurate. It's kind of like taking all of those elements and then um, stepping outside of the rules and, and putting them together in different ways that um, aren't necessarily correct, but are what I want to express. And so a thing that you will kind of see is that um, I'm trying to 
make something that's aesthetically pleasing, but also that educates. So one thing that you'll notice, uh, like top here, um, this figure, but all the other figures are in profile because um, that's just the way that they drew, kind of like the way the Egyptians. The face is always in profile, the, the action is always happening, and there's, you're, you are the viewer on a stage. Um, you see a lot of it even in, in uh, the ceramics, like you're looking in on an, uh, uh, an event that's happening. Um, also, if you see top uh, left in there, it's almost like the way that you would see in comic books. Um, that's like the, the word is there, you know, associated to the person. And sometimes you actually see almost like a squiggly line coming out, denoting that that person is talking. Again, uh, in the middle one, this one's called Quetzalcoatl, which is uh, a long feathered uh, serpent that flies. And uh, this is my version of Quetzalcoatl, because I always see this very stylized dragon looking thing. Um, one of the interesting things is that gods can have dual forms. You can, they could be in the animal form, and they could be in the human form. And that's why you see the human in there as well. But I, I took out the, the long body and, and, and kind of just made it my own. This is the way I would design it. So what you've done is taken the ancient and made it contemporary. You've put a spin on it almost mm -hmm. to create the same or similar message, but different uh, approach to it. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. And so the rest of the uh, illustrations basically show the same thing. You've taken the ancient symbols and given it a modern spin. Yeah, yes. Uh, so like the top right one is uh, the stylized way that you would write uh, name, date of birth in, on, a, on like a monument. Uh, because one of the things that you find that was kind of interesting is that all of the records are very dry in that um, it's all about like you were born this date, your name is this, you had this amount of things, and it's very tax documenty without any real narrative in between to tell about mm -hmm. maybe that person. And why the red and the yellow? Why those colors? So those um, are some of my favorites of the palette that's available because um, the, you have certain dyes that are made from, from bugs, from plants. And, and so like this is, there's an actual uh, San Bartolo mural that I really love and in, inspired by that they're still like putting together that I, I drew these colors from. Wonderful. Well, then that leads us right over to the hieroglyphs and the Mayan language that you decided to give us a story about as well. Yeah. So let's hit there. Well, Leo, we know that hieroglyphs are a big part of ancient history and uh, origination of language. So tell us how you came up with this amazing piece. Okay, yeah, this, uh, what you see on the wall is um, all of the glyphs that you would see on this codex. Um, so. You see this accordion fold, this is how their, their books were made. Um, not with the traditional spine down the middle that we know. They have this accordion fold and the image on the wall is so that you can see all of the text. Because just it's tough to display the front and back. Uh, you would typically have, um, the bound, it would be bound with jaguar pelt on the front and back. Mm -hmm. And you would... Um, also, one of the interesting things about having this accordion fold is because the Maya talked about time all, a lot. Uh, you could have an event here and an event here, talk about them separately, but then the way the paper folds, you fold them together so that they're adjoining to each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of, it's fascinating the, the way that they played with language and time. And as we look at this piece right here, I'm sure that Various symbols mean various types of conversation or symbolic to life, death, or rebirth. I know that that was a big part of the culture as well. So tell us, maybe pick out a section and tell us what it means and what it says. Yeah, you have uh, the way that they're written in red. You don't read it across. You would go one block, two block, and then down to the next row. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and then you go to the next column mm -hmm. down. And it starts with the, what's called like a dedication. So it, it's actually saying, uh, written by me. It has the date and then uh, that it was made at the McCall. And so how did 
these symbols come about? If you, for instance, you said it was written by you, is it actually your name or is it, mm -hmm. it is actually your name? And how did you create that? Was it from the combination of what we talked about earlier with the scribing system of combining the ancient and the uh, yeah. contemporary? Yeah, there was a, it was kind of a challenge because uh, there were right now four legitimate codices or Mayan books that still exist. And what's there, you can kind of like, you know, the verbs, you can take them and use them how you want. But there's words that don't exist or there's no record of them. And so there are, um, there's actually five different Maya dialects that I have dictionaries for of the people that are still there speaking. So I took those words and then translated them with the ancient hieroglyphs to, to get the text that I was missing. So it really is kind of like taking the old and the new wow. and putting it together. Yeah. So how did you come up, for instance, we have the bottom line. What, tell us what that says in so many words. Yeah, so if you go over one, two, three, four, you, you begin an, a, a sequence that's actually, um, you can see it here on the bottom row of the codex, these two. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, the death symbol, then it's followed by the life symbol, the death symbol, and then the rebirth symbol. And it just repeats. Because that's one of the, one of the things that I kind of wanted to get across was that of their unique perspective on time. Uh, in the Western world, it's very linear. Uh, what has been will never be again. And with the Maya, it was, it was very cyclical in that uh, what has been will be again and again and again. And with, with the concept of rebirth, mm -hmm. a continuation uh, or a flowing of right. moving forward. Fantastic. And so tell us about the paper. I think that's really intriguing for our guests to know about that because yeah. they would never believe the story without hearing so, it. Yeah, so looking into uh, the history and digging in and, and, find, and trying to find the original text to do translation, to like build up the vocabulary, like where are all the words? I found that there's an event that happened with a uh, Franciscan friar, Diego de Landa, where he rounded up all of the codices, uh, thousands of them, and burned them all. And so that's why there's only four left. And so, you know, you, uh, one of the challenges talking about the dryness of the language that's left over is where is the poetry? Where are the jokes? Where, where is all the other stuff? Conversation. Right. And so in my public school education, there wasn't really a lot of talk about the people, you know, the Indians in the rainforest, right? N not accurate at all. So when I was digging in, um, kind of thinking, okay, what do you write? You know, out of the, like, I'm going to be making something, you know, there is no Mayan poetry, there, there's no, none of that. So I thought, like, what's more uh, a universal thing? And I got on to the Greek loves. So yeah, familial love, divine love, brotherly love. And, I, and that's, where, that's what I started to, you know, pull from the past and, and the present, these words that didn't exist. Because um, in the Mayan language, there's a, there's a word for the walk that you take, uh, that a girl takes with her boyfriend that has no end. And I was like, that's beautiful. And so like, but that's not in this old, old text. So putting that all together, and I came up and did the Greek love. So I call it the, the Gonzales Codex, but it's also, I call it the Love Codex. Mm -hmm because each chapter talks about each different love that you have. And then the next question is, so what do you write it on? Um, and I thought that the most fitting thing to continue with the cyclical nature, it would be to use Bibles. And so while I was at the McCall, I actually took Bibles, uh, went to thrift stores, got people to donate Bibles, and um, just basically shredded them up, put them in with water in, in a blender, and made rolls of, of paper, and that's what this is. You can actually see some of the text of amazing. the Bible. Yes, I do see some, <laughs> I yeah. see some words for and, and another word. That is a, amazing, but that also shows the creativity that an artist has that can bring to life exactly what happened so many years ago. It all, this piece also talks about the universality of love mm -hmm. and that continuation that even though it may be defined in different ways, there's still this holistic universality of loving one another, either through divine relationships or otherwise. Mm -hmm. So I love the fact that you chose that because that's yeah. much of what we talk about today. It's one thing, uh, yeah, with this, it was, it was you can uh, hate the medium, but you can't really hate the message. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
the paper really looks old and authentic too from the <laughs> technique that you used. So that's fantastic. But those are your drawings on the paper, oh, yeah. correct? Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Let's go to the next piece. Okay. We're looking at the piece you entitled The Tree of Life, Julio. And it looks like a play on a, a traditional headdress that you've taken and given it a modern spin. And even uh, from a standpoint of also using textiles as mm -hmm. a part of this piece. So tell us a little bit about this modern day headdress. Yeah, with uh, headdresses, a, a lot of my process comes from asking that question of, of like wondering what if. And so with this, it's the, oh, the whole headdress series is what would the Maya do with knitting? different technologies, uh, like 3D printing, just different things like that, that they didn't necessarily have access to when they were creating their originals. And so with knitting, it's taking uh, mythologies and, and this, this concept of the tree of life, um, the worldview is what you see here. So for the Maya, going back to uh, the metaphor with the, so Atlas stands on the back of a turtle. Uh, for the Maya, the earth was the back, the ridges of a caiman, like an alligator. And that's what you see here. You, ha you have a lot of double-headed serpents. And so that, that back is the, the world that we know. And then you have a tree coming up out of the top, which is the savia tree. And um, it's akin to, like in our minds, what we think of like redwood, sequoia, when we think of grandness. Like that's the big tree for them. Because at night, if you stand underneath one and look up, it really does look like it connects to the, to the stars. Right. And then. You have this struggle of life and death that w they would have seen, you know, going on all the time, the, the flora and the fauna. And so you have this alligator that's, that's always in the water. Um, and it's, these are the animals that it's eating. So there's, there's deer there. If you're ever in the Yucatan Peninsula, deer tacos, highly recommend it. There are uh, howler monkeys, spider monkeys, uh, bats. Um, there's a jaguar. There's a jaguar there are, we are there on the far end there. Um, you have these flowers in the back that you see. And then as you go down deeper, you get to uh, the underworld, this darkness. And then below that, for them, it, the alligator was on the back of a tortoise shell. Mm -hmm. And so when the wearer puts it on, they actually become the embodiment of the story. And uh, with a lot of these, the, the goal is kind of like um, it's functional headwear that, that tells mythology. So like you can, ex you can put this on and talk to a child and explain the Maya worldview with it. That is fascinating. Did you knit that yourself? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I actually work with uh, another artist in, uh, she's in uh, Canada. And we go back and forth. And again, it all starts from the drawings. Um, I'll knit things or draw things. And she'll say, this won't work. This won't stay on the head. And then we go back and forth with the elements like that. And it also ties into, um, in 2012, when uh, there was a kind of a, not a scare, but kind of concerns with people that it was the apocalypse that, that the mind. Yeah, so that kind of jump-started a, a lot of the pieces, actually, because I had, I was, you know, I had ideas. But then when I saw, like, the hysteria for the 2012 uh, end of the world. I was like, wait a minute. No, it's just going to reset. Let's, I actually did a show. Um, that was my first show that I put on. It was all of this, this work, uh, paintings and, and drawings, and like the beginnings of these kind of well, to explain, like, hey, it's not going to end. It's just going to restart. Well, for sure. Here we are in 2021. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we are continuing right. to move forward. Is it the good times or the bad times? Right. Time? <laughs> we got a little bit, a little bit of that, but we keep moving forward. Yeah. It is never ending yeah. in this concept. Fantastic. One more piece I want us to look at. OK. OK. Julia, we're looking at a second headdress that you've done, the deity Itzamna. Tell us about that, what that term means as far as deity in the culture and what each piece of the headdress symbolizes. Yeah, so Itzamna is, is one of the bigger gods, um, has multiple different uh, aspects, could be human, could be dragon, serpent shape. And what you have um, on the side here is you have the, the head in green and in red is this hand that's coming out. And typically, you see this on pottery, on uh, the codices, and it's coming out, and it'll have a quill in the hand. Because uh, this is the god that is said to have taught humans how to write and draw. 
and in the Maya language, those are one and the same. To be able to write is to be able to draw. Um, you have other aspects. Again, the whole idea is that you know, you're able to embody that, this character when you wear this. Also, um, just a teaching, teachable moment with this for headdresses in general. If you look at a lot of headdresses, they were functional as well in that um, scribes have almost what looks like a bag type headdress where they have their paper and their quills. Um, people who you see that they have uh, animals like that they've hunted, like turkeys, um, pigs, boars. And then also, so this one is a taper, which is an animal that's still eaten and there now, is still hunted, used for meat. So it's up there. So you have like the celestial being, but also the functionality of a headdress as well. Um, also, there is the long hair that's coming out of the back because that is a, um, you, you find it all across the indigenous cultures. The long hair is a, is a point of pride, and it was one of the tools used uh, during colonial times to, to kind of like, like break them. They would actually cut off all of their hair. So uh, there's, that's why that is in there. And, and some of the other headdresses I've actually designed specifically to be worn for someone with the long hair to float out of. The, the mask looks like also a great tool to help teach, to teach mm -hmm. children in classes, but also to teach about culture and the Maya culture and how important it really is to our current day culture here in America. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit uh, too about the materials that you use. Again, I see that it's a knitted piece mm -hmm. and um, the, symbol, the symbolism that you have with taking that ancient piece making it modern day, would someone actually wear this or is it wearable now? Yeah, yeah for the longest time, I, I would wear it. The, uh, the pro so I, I was in Canada, um, funny enough that I collaborate with a Canadian, but I was in Canada, it was in March, and I had this idea and um, I got off the, the plane and my ears were just on fire because it was so cold. And on the flight back, I was like, okay, <laughs> I need to cover this. I know exactly how to design this because it, when I, early on, I was told now by other curators, don't wear this anymore. Um, they, I, I had problems because it was never cold enough here mm -hmm. to really oh, figure yeah. out how to wear it. And yes. so that's, once that happened, then it, and I kind of figured out, and that helped me figure out also, because all of these start with like, how do you attach it to your head without it falling off? Design challenges, um, how do you articulate a hand? What you might or might not know is that uh, the, the, the way to, around that was to order a mannequin hand and we oh, knitted around it. I see. So you actually wore this uh, yeah. in Canada? Uh, in Charlotte. In Charlotte? All the time. I, I actually, <laughs> when, when they're all completed, I, I now I, I kind of like do maybe four or five wearings. Uh, just to wear it, you know? So you mean in everyday life? Like when it's cold the in the wintertime, yeah. <laughs> and do you get people approaching you about it to ask you what it means? No one does. I get laughs and then cool hat. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Our kids today would just be that bold that they would probably wear something like this. And the colors are great. Yeah, I think more, I mean, more color, more just unique clothing. I mean, I'm kind of dressed not the way I would... I, I embrace all of it. Yes, yes, we do too. And that's why we're featuring you here in this exhibition to talk about interventions. Thank you so much, Julio. And oh, we look thank forward you. to doing many more projects with you as well. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Julio, just as we make this transition from this part, we're going to go to one of your friends, Alejandro oh, great. Cruz, who is going to do some storytelling with us and do this next part of this wonderful presentation. That's awesome. I love his work. Fantastic. Alejandro Galvez Cruz, de Mizquiahuala, Mizquil, que quiere decir mezquite, y Yaguali, lugar de, cercado de, Mizquiahuali, Mizquiahuala, lugar cercado de mezquites. Vamos a seguir con la tradición oral de los cuentacuentos y de las historias orales de nuestros ancestros indígenas. Hoy tenemos la leyenda Músicos del Sol. Espero que la disfruten. 
En un momento, cuando se creó el universo y se creó los planetas y la tierra, bajo la creación, se veía que había mares, había bosques, había montañas, había ríos, había los frutos, árboles, pero la gente estaba triste. ¿Qué es lo que pasaba con la gente? La gente estaba desalentada, estaba triste. Entonces nuestro padre de Escatipoca dijo, ¿Qué, ¿qué pasa? ¿Qué es lo que le pasa a nuestra gente? ¿Qué pasa a nuestra gente? Está triste. Tiene mares, tiene ríos, tiene montañas, los frutos, las semillas. ¿Qué es lo que pasa a nuestra gente? ¿Por qué está triste? Se dio cuenta que los músicos estaban con el sol. La música la tenía nuestro padre Tonatiu. Entonces le encargó a Quetzalcóatl la tarea de ir a buscar al sol, a Tonatiu, y decirle, pedirle que nos compartiera la música y los músicos con el, la gente de nuestra tierra. Entonces, para llegar al sol, un pato de Tonatiu, que hasta el cual tuvo que correr, correr, cruzando montañas, cruzando ríos, cruzando praderas, bajo la lluvia, truenos. Seguía corriendo hasta cierto punto en que se cansó y dijo es bastante para mí, estoy muy cansado. Fue como llegó Mazatl, venado, y le dijo súbete a mi espalda y yo te llevaré hasta donde está el sol. Y ambos corrieron, se subió en su espalda, montó y siguieron corriendo, cruzando valles, cruzando ríos, montañas, hasta llegar a un punto en que estaban frente al mar. Mazatl dijo yo no puedo continuar. Yo soy un animal terrestre. Hasta aquí termina mi compañía contigo. Fue entonces que se apareció la tortuga. Tortuga le dijo, súbete a mi espalda, yo te llevaré. Cruzaremos el océano y te llevaré hasta donde está Tonatiu, nuestro padre Sol. Y ambos nadaron por días, por noches, cruzando océanos. Hasta que en cierto momento llegaron a donde estaba nuestro padre Sol, Tonatiu. Que hasta el cual le dijo humildemente, Padre mío, Padre Tonatiu, comparte con nosotros, con los humanos, con la gente, con las mujeres, con los hombres, los niños, tu música. Padre Tonatiu dijo, ¿qué me ofrendes a cambio? ¿Qué me das a cambio? Que hasta el cual dijo, ofrezco los cantos de las aves para que las mañanas alegren cuando despierta. Padre Tonatiu dijo, ¿qué más me ofreces para darte la música? Hasta el cual dijo, te ofrezco el canto de las águilas al amanecer para que con su vuelo iluminen tu camino. Además, te ofrezco el sonido del viento para refrescar la mañana. El jaguar irá contigo. Mientras tú cruzas, el jaguar te acompañará. Y la serpiente irá contigo. Tonatiu dijo, puedes llevarte la música y los músicos para que la gente esté alegre, para que la gente cante, baile, para que la gente exprese un sentimiento, sus sentimientos, hombres, mujeres, niños, adultos, ancianos, expresen a través de la música el sentimiento.
Og med det, Olk.